Bless the Lord, O my soul, bless it. An exorcism is fundamentally a fight over the person's, essentially, soul. Who do you belong to? Essentially, do you belong to Jesus or do you belong to Satan? And Satan will often, always actually, claim uh, possession. And so, one of the first things out of a demon's mouth is, you belong to me. And then we say, no, no, this person belongs to Jesus. This person has been baptized. This person claims Christ as his or her Savior. So let's do that now. Let's pray with me. I'm going to do the uh, renew the baptismal promises, which is fundamentally saying, I belong to Jesus. So, do you renounce Satan? I do. And all his works? I do. And all his empty promises? I do. Let's say it with a little more energy. Do you renounce Satan? I do. And all his works? I do. And all his empty promises? I do. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? I do. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered, died, rose from the dead, now sits at the right hand of the Father? I do. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body and life everlasting? I do. I claim you for Christ our Savior by the sign of his cross. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you and I belong to Jesus. Hi there, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to another video on Armor of God. As always, I'd like to say thank you so much to all of you for taking the time to watch this video or any other videos in this channel. We know there are lots of other interesting and fun videos on YouTube, but the fact that you decided to spend some time watching this truly means a lot. And with that, hopefully you won't be disappointed, and I can only say that you'll learn a lot from this video. I've been sharing a lot about Monsignor Stephen Rossetti, the chief exorcist of the Archdiocese of Washington recently, and I'll be making a compilation of what he shared with all of you through this video. Before I carry on with this video, I would also like to add that I am giving away three free copies of Monsignor Rossetti's book, Diary of an American Exorcist, this month, so don't miss that out. I'll be buying the book from Amazon, so if your location is available for shipping on Amazon, it should be fine. Now buckle up, and let's get right on with the video. In this video, I'll be sharing his answers on the following questions. What do demons look like? The dangers of curses, and what to do about it. The devil can only give what he has. The curses associated with Freemasonry, haunted houses and infestations. Are all tattoos evil? The devil can't control our free will, lifting financial curses, and many more, and to make it easy for you to navigate these subjects in this video, I've placed the time frame for each specific subject in the pinned comment below so feel free to check it out and jump to the respective subjects according to your preference. Just about every religion, Christian, or otherwise, has a belief in an evil spirit, and many, many of them, most of them perhaps have an exorcism ritual. Islam does. The Jewish faith does. Of course, the Protestant faiths do as well. So sure, there are other faiths that do exorcisms, but are they effective? Monsignor Rossetti thinks they are because God is generous. When we turn to God and ask for his help, when we've got demons affecting us, God will hear that prayer. But what makes the Catholic exorcists different then? Well, let's hear it from him. We believe in the Catholic Church that we have a special commission from Jesus to do this and a special authority. Which is why oftentimes people will say, if you've got a demon, yeah, go to see a Catholic priest, because they're the ones who have been specifically commissioned and have the authority from Christ to cast out Satan. He is also often asked about tattoos, and are tattoos evil? Can tattoos be the portal to the demonic? What do the exorcist has to say about it? I think what he has to say about it will be very helpful to some of you who might be asking this very question. About tattoos, and sometimes they need to be blessed and to cut the demonic connection to them. For example, some people, the worst thing you can do would be to tattoo a demon on, on yourself. We've seen people do it. Uh, uh, Baphomet, uh, an evil of, of uh, figure, uh, a kamana, any sort of demon. You're basically branding yourself and connecting yourself in service to this demon, which is, you need to get rid of it. And uh, say the prayers and hopefully get that taken off your body. 
But there are other times when people have uh, symbols or tattoos which of themselves are not bad, but were placed on them through a process that was cursed. Some people will use cursed uh, ink uh, or curse the individual. Some of these tattoo places are not the most savory of places. So again, they should be removed and certainly uh, say the prayer of blessing. Other times though, we've seen some rather innocuous ones, but they were put on the person's body at a bad time in their life. We had one person who was involved in the sex industry. She converted, thank God. And she, uh, but that, that uh, tattoo was a, a portal, even though it was an uh, innocuous symbol. It was a portal for the demonic. We had to bless it many, many times. And we'd put holy water on it. And she would scream and she'd say, oh, it's burning, it's burning. The water was cold. Uh, so it was a clear demonic portal that we finally neutralized by the grace of God. Uh, can there be uh, innocuous tattoos that have no evil effect? Sure, I, I think anyway. I don't recommend you do tattoos. Uh, but I, I know one person has a little strawberry on his ankle. I say, well, you know. Uh, but I don't recommend tattoos, frankly. Some people say, well, I want to honor the Mother of God. You want to honor the Mother of God? Don't put a big tattoo of Our Lady on your body. Wear a miraculous medal like I do. I have a little miraculous medal on. Or the scapular, the, the brown scapular. So there are lots of ways to honor the Lord or our friends or loved ones uh, without putting some marks on our bodies. And let's use holy things. Uh, images of Our Lady, the scapular, the rosary, the miraculous medal, and uh, let's honor Jesus and his beautiful mother. And for the next clip, well, to start, I'll just say this. We've all seen it in movies. When Hollywood tries to depict how these demons look like, they're ugly, creepy, scary to look at. But it's easy to forget, after watching these kind of movies, that demons are fallen angels to begin with. And so, according to Monsignor Rossetti, demons don't look like anything because they're pure spiritual beings. They have no bodies, just like when angels have wings. The fact is they really don't have wings, and instead the wings simply symbolize the speed of the angels. They move with the speed of thought, and demons are often displayed or seen by mystics as misshapen beasts. They're naked because they're not human, or they have no real personness or whole personness, so they're grotesque. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, one mystic who I, I'm convinced that she had a real vision of demons uh, said that they are blacker than black, and they are horrible beyond description. She said the horror movies that we see on TV are cartoon characters compared to how really ugly, evil and uh, the demons look like. And, and Sister Faustina, the famous mystic, uh, Paul, the Polish sisters said, you would rather suffer all the sufferings of, of, of the world than have one glimpse of the true nature of Satan. You see, we're living in an increasingly pagan world, so you never know if the person sitting next to you on a subway or the person cooking your meal in a restaurant is placing a curse on you. We don't know. And so I thought it's rather interesting to share what Monsignor Rossetti experienced when someone tried to place a curse on him, and I think in some ways. We can relate to his experience and try to be more aware of how we go about in our day-to-day -day living. Father Gabriel, he uh, was a famous exorcist and a holy guy, and he said that 90% of his cases of possession were the result of a spell or a curse, which is interesting. Our Lord Court teaches us, you know, when he wants us to learn something. So I'll give an, here's how I learned about curses. I'm riding on the train from Rome to Tre Fontane. Tre Fontane is a wonderful place where the uh, Trappists have an abbey, the site of St. Paul's beheading. And also across the street is a Marian apparition site called Our Lady Revelation. So it's, it's a beautiful one day visit. So I'm riding the train. And this guy comes up to me, a little disheveled and looks a little bit you know, off. And he, he, he asked me for, for some money. Now, I don't give people on the streets money by giving food or cookies. I had some cookies in my, so I, I for that purpose. So I pulled out the cookies and I handed him, I said, here's some, some cookies. He looked at me and he was enraged. I mean, look in the face, you say, whoa. He was enraged and stared at me for an uncomfortably long period of time. So I said, whoa, that's strange. And so he walks away and instantly, wham, I felt like a, a, a gale force wind was blowing through my brain. I mean, it was really, it was ugly. It was a real attack. And I said, what is that? I said, oh, he cursed you. So being a priest, I slapped both hands in my head and said an exorcism prayer. I'm sure I have a short prayer. And it, by the time the prayer ended, 
went away immediately. So I said, okay, Lord, I got the message. There are such things as curses, and you gotta pay attention to it. Many Catholics view Freemasonry as a dangerous, even satanic, conspiracy founded to destroy the faith. On the other hand, the craft likes to present itself as an ancient order dedicated to the brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of God. Some of the brethren may take that description seriously, depending on which room of the Masonic edifice they inhabit. See why the Catholic Church has strongly and repeatedly condemned membership in Freemasonry or any of its allied movements requires a glance at Masonic teachings and history. Freemasons pretend to preserve ancient secrets handed down from Solomon's builders and pagan mystery cults via the medieval Knights Templar. The craft claims to offer light unobtainable elsewhere that will perfect the initiate and improve society. Their foremost modern commentator, Henry Wilson Coyle, describes Freemasonry as a system of morality and social ethics, a primitive religion, and a philosophy of life. But the real origin of the craft, as Masonic historians now admit, lies in Renaissance esotericism, injected into the guild traditions developed by medieval stoneworkers. Spurred by interest in the symbolic possibilities of architecture, men who were not professional stomasons began joining workmen's lodges in Scotland in the 1590s, these fellowships had just been turned into permanent organizations by the king's chief builder, a Catholic named William Shaw. Freemasonry teaches a rival religion of naturalism. Whether it plots, persecutes, blasphemes, engages in philanthropy, or behaves politely, it treats all religions as equal but inferior to its own Gnostic wisdom. Alas, the vaunted profundity on offer never manifests itself from the shadows of secrecy. Even after a man has taken every degree known in the Masonic mansion, he will be no more enlightened than when he began, but considerably farther from the true light. The great architect, the universe of deism and Freemasonry, is not the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit of Christians. Church's rejection of Freemasonry has not been lifted. It's still, you know, verboten, and any of those sort of organizations that are connected to Freemasonry. Uh, and there are really curses uh, connected to it. The people will see in their family members a continuing kind of uh, problem, a cursed problem. It just, keep, uh, it just it can't seem to shake it, whether it's uh, uh, generation infidelity, uh, strange deaths, addiction, generational abuse, all sorts of things. And it just happens again and again and again and again. It just it starts becoming strange. Why does our family appear to have this curse? Well, when you look back at a number of these families, what you find is that, you know, uh, grandparent, uh, parent, uh, uh, great-grandparent was a high-level Mason. And you may not have been a Mason, but we go through the uh, prayers to reject the, the curses. This is from Father Chad Ripperger. Uh, Ch Father Chad says, if you were a member of a Masonic organization or a descendant of someone who was, it's recommended that you say these prayers and they're on our app. It's advisable to read through it first so you know what is involved. It is best to pray this aloud in the presence of a witness. So people first start to pray and they can't get through it. I mean, they, they start choking and they can't. Some people can't even say it because the, the curse is that strong. I would say say that and uh, say it in front of uh, another person who's a good Catholic. For the next clip, well, we've seen or heard stuff like this happening, whether it's in paranormal videos or in horror movies. Things moving on their own, sounds of people running in the hallway, knocking on doors, and so on. You get the picture. There will be some who are skeptical about this kind of things, and will try to reason with science or saying it's just your imagination. Not until they experience it for themselves, then they will finally have to admit that it's actually real. Demonic infestation is real. You know the doll in the Conjuring movies, that can happen in real life too. I've heard too many exorcists speaking about it. It's not something that can be dismissed as simply a figment of our imagination. The real question someone should be asking is, what did you do to invite evil into your home recently? Or what did the people who stayed in your house do previously that invited the demonic into your home? You know, it's like a bad movie. The lights turn off and on, the things start flying around, you hear these sounds and whistling and then noises and banging and these orbs of light going around and cold spots and hot spots. And just, it just, it's just wild. There was one case where a guy called me up and he was desperate. It turns out the family was so frightened that they all were sleeping in the same bed at night. And they were not even believers. Well, two sessions and 
it was and now they're in the front pews of their church, of course. <laughs> so they figured they learned the hard way uh, that, that these things are real. One thing that really just kind of upset me and them then is they, they go to their parish priest and say, we've got demons in our house. And he, and he, they, he tells the priest all their symptoms. And, he, and the priest asks him if they have mice. <laughs> mice. You know, it's like mice. Yeah, banging everything. No, it's just ridiculous. You know, there, there are real infestations. And, and typically because some very evil things have been done in the house. For those of you who might be asking, do witches have power? Some people say no, there's no power to witchcraft, but according to Monsignor Rossetti, that's not true. They do, in a way. There are some proficient witches who really can strongly influence situations, but where do these witches get their power? A witch might think she's manipulating these spiritual forces, but as Father Gabriel Morth told us, the witches get their power from demons, and some people who are practicing witchcraft might say, no, I have this innate spiritual power. The truth is you don't. Witches get their power from demons whether they know it or not, and so this should be rather frightening to them. They'll say, I'm a witch and I'm controlling the demons. No, you're not. You have no control over demons. They're controlling you and manipulating you, whether you know it or not. Many exorcists are always very clear about this very subject. You are not able to control demons. You're under their thumb. So the question is, what can witches do? Witches can do anything that demons can do, but fortunately there is a limit to that. Thank God that the Lord limits what witches can do and what demons can do in this life, which is good. But why would God allow this? Well, according to Monsignor Rossetti, God allows people to do all sorts of evil things for free will. He allows us to do bad things, and one of those bad things that people do is they practice witchcraft. It's a very real phenomenon, and it should go without saying, with a warning that anyone who's practicing witchcraft should stop it immediately. You are being manipulated by the devil. What we should also remember is that the devil does not control our free will. He can't do anything about it. Well, sometimes people ask Satan to have this person fall in love with them. He can't do that. He can't force someone's free will. Satan has no control over our, over our free will, by the way. Uh, but, but can he give you some material benefit? Yeah, he could probably work it out, give you some material benefit. Is, is it worth the price of your soul? I mean, come on. You know, uh, is, that's the whole thing. Choose God uh, rather than Satan. Satan wants to destroy you. Sure, he'll give you a bauble or two, but in the end, he'll take your soul because of it. When, when you make a, a deal with Satan, no matter how simple it might seem, now you became a slave. Did you know that Father Chad Ripperger has a book of deliverance prayers for the lady? I think a lot of you know this already, but I'd just like to highlight about the prayer that's not recommended by the exorcist to be used by the lady and why. The imprecatory prayers. And the reason why the exorcists are not recommending the lady to use these prayers is they do not want lady to be commanding the demons. 
Let's hear more from Monsignor Rossetti himself. There are also books. Father Chad Ribberger has a book, Deliverance Prayers for the Laity. So that's a good book as well. So there are lots of ways. The only uh, thing we recommend is that the laity do not use what we call imprecatory prayers. We do not want laity commanding demons. Uh, it's not a good idea, unless it's over your own body. For example, we had one guy, the demons were, were attacking him. He, he said, in Jesus' name, get off me. He said it three times, they left. So if they're affecting you, your spouse, or your children, sure, you can command demons. But other than that, don't, because you're really going to spiritually uh, get in, in over your head. So, But you can use deprecatory prayers. Just direct the prayer to the Lord. Jesus, we ask you to cast out the demons. Lord, please cast out the demons. Mary, please come and cast out the demons. So that's the only difference we'd say. Just simply direct your prayer to the Lord and don't go facha facha with demons. Monsignor Rossetti also advises that when we buy a house or a car, don't forget to have it blessed. Traditionally, people have always had it blessed because we don't know what's been going on in the house before. And even if there aren't demons there, it's a good thing to ask for a blessing. We want our lives to be consecrated to God and we want God's blessing there. So have a priest come in and bless the house, bless your car. And for Monsignor Rossetti, even shared his own personal habit. When he go to a hotel room, we don't know what happened in those rooms before, and so before he goes to bed in a hotel room, he will be throwing holy water around the room, constantly invoking the Lord's protection and grace. Anyway, for the next audio clip of Monsignor Rossetti will be a bit long, five minutes long, but it's worth it because it's regarding financial curses, and he will even invite you to join in a prayer. Please listen for a moment. I've seen more and more uh, cases of people who had this long string of inexpl inexplicable financial setbacks. It just don't make sense. They're good money man managers. They're good financial people, but they just can't seem to get their head above water. And it's just one constant mishap after the next. And finally, after a long time, they say, this is, this is not normal. Something's going on here. I feel like I've been cursed. And in fact, you may be. So, uh, for many uh, who have bad financial uh, management skills, you should get some training in, in dealing with, with finances money. But for some people, they actually are financially cursed. We had one case, for example, uh, the, the grandparent was angry at the, the young couple. Uh, she didn't like them getting married, and she went to a witch and had them cursed and said, you'll never have anything, and they, and they don't. Uh, another case of a businessman who, uh, a fine businessman and lots of money coming through his business, but can never seem to to get ahead. And the inexplicable things breaking down, strange bills, it's just, just unbelievable. So uh, some of you are financially cursed. So what I'd like to do is take you through a prayer to lift these financial curses. I'll have you uh, say a certain prayer, and then I'll ratify it as a priest. Now, your prayer, you're going to invoke your natural law uh, rights over your own property. You have the right, by the natural law, by God's law, uh, to, to control and, and to use your finances and property appropriately. So we're going to invoke that uh, natural law. You're going to command any demons to leave, and you're going to lift any curses. And then I, as a priest, will invoke the church's authority, ratify that, and cast out any demons. Now, also, by the way, in addition to having you lift the curses, we're going to have you consecrate yourself and all your property to the mother of Jesus, uh, the Virgin Mary. Now, for those of you who are not Catholic, uh, you can just simply substitute uh, the word Jesus. We Catholics realize that when you consecrate things to the Virgin Mary, ultimately it's consecrated to Jesus. She, she leads us all to Jesus. So, Catholics, Feel free to say Virgin Mary. Uh, those who are not Catholic might want to say uh, Jesus. So uh, let's pray for a moment in silence. Okay, re repeat after me. I invoke the natural law rights over my own property and finances. I lift any curses sent against me or my property or finances. I deliver and consecrate myself to the Virgin Mary, or Jesus, including all my goods, both interior and exterior, 
and even the value of all my actions, past, present, and future. I ask the Virgin Mary, <clears throat> or Jesus, to receive now the full right of disposing of these goods according to God's holy will. May she cast out all evil spirits, sanctify these goods, protect them from future evil, and use them for the glory of God. And now I'll ratify it. In the most holy name of Jesus, by the authority of my priesthood, I invoke the keys of St. Peter and I ratify your breaking of each and every financial, business, property curse, and all curses coming against you and your family, affecting your livelihood, your property, your finances, or any goods or any works. I witness and ratify your consecration of yourself and all your goods to Mary and thus to Jesus. With that same authority in Jesus' name, I bind any all evil spirits that may have attached themselves to you or harass you in any way as a result of these curses. And I command them to leave you now, go immediately directly to the foot of the cross of our Lord Jesus to deal with as he wills. Vade, recto santos, get behind me, Satan. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command the demons to leave you now, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And may you indeed be at peace. God bless you. There was one conversation that Monsignor Rossetti had with the demons where he commanded the demons to tell him, because this is part of getting rid of them and it's torturous for them. He said, in the holy name of Jesus, he commanded, tell me the truth. Did you make a bad decision rejecting God? Yes. Now in Jesus' name, tell me the truth. Are you suffering now because of it? Yes. Now, finally, in Jesus' name, he again commanded, tell me the truth. Would you change your decision if you could? No. The mystery of evil, they are locked into this, but they don't want to go to heaven. They don't want to be with God. They're going to spend an eternity raging against God. And sadly, the fallen souls are raging against God and raging against everything, and they're full of hatred and anger, but in reality, like the demons, it's their own fault. Yo, know, it is true that uh, Satan attacks families. What I especially see is uh, discord and conflict. What Satan will do will be take little, you know, the sources and rubs that are always in all these family conflicts, and he'll exaggerate them and try to uh, break apart the family. Now, which is one of the important reasons why we get married in the church, because marriage uh, in, is a sacrament in the church, and so is a source of grace and blessing. And, the, and families should pray together, especially the family rosary. So, yes, Satan does try to do, destroy families, but uh, he's nothing compared to the power of Christ in family. So get married in the church, pray the family rosy together, go to church together on Sunday and pray. And uh, don't be too concerned about Satan. Jesus, Lord. And as for the final clip of Monsignor Rossetti for this video, I'll share one thing he said about the powerful name of Jesus, which is torturous for the demons. But what's more important is why we shouldn't be saying the name of our Lord in vain, which I think is rather widespread. In one of our exorcisms, of course, we were saying the name of Jesus often. And at one point, the demon said, stop saying that name. It was torturing them. And so what did we do? Of course, we said it all the more. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The name is, uh, of Jesus has a powerful uh, impact. It has power of itself because of Christ, of course. So... When we do exorcisms, we cast out demons in the name of Jesus, of course. But that's important for all of us, that the name of Jesus should never be used in vain. Why do people swear using the, the holy thing, uh, the name of Jesus? It's like taking, would you take a white sweater and then throw it into the mud? No. Why would we take the holy name of Jesus and, and use it as a cuss word? Uh, it reminds me of uh, an incident with St. Gemma Galgani, that wonderful Italian mystic, a young woman, 
when people would swear in front of her several times, she just passed out. She was, it was so upsetting to her, to a holy person. So let's reverence the name of Jesus and love the name of Jesus. Say it with reverence and devotion. Jesus, Jesus, the holy name of Jesus. And when we do, we are blessed. Now that's all for this video compilation this time. I hope you've learned a lot from this video and I'll try to put together a more useful compilation for you guys in the future in the hope that what these exorcists are sharing with us can be useful to you in your own spiritual warfare. And finally, thanks so much for taking the time to watch this video. I do try to upload daily, but sometimes I just have to take a little bit more time to put together valuable information so it's not simply the matter of making a compilation for the sake of it. If any of you would like to make a donation to help out with my works, especially covering the cost for better visual aids to avoid using any copyrighted images or videos in the future, I have included the link to the PayPal donation in the description box below. I don't want to include this request in the early part of this video because it's rather awkward asking something like this. So any contribution is really appreciated, and I hope to deliver a more compelling and using better visual aids, photos, or videos for future videos. So again, thanks so much everybody and God bless you.